Good evening. My name is Leora Klein, and as the co-founder of 3GNY, I'm honored to introduce tonight's program. 3GNY is joined by Liberation 75 and the American Society for Yad Vashem Young Leadership in a special commemoration for Yom HaShoah. Primo Levi, the brilliant chemist, writer, and survivor of Auschwitz, was able to articulate why the Holocaust must be spoken of. He wrote, and I quote, we must be listened to. Above and beyond our personal experience, we have collectively witnessed a fundamental unexpected event. Fundamental precisely because unexpected, not foreseen by anyone. It happened, therefore it can happen again. This is the core of what we have to say. It can happen and it can happen everywhere. As the grandchildren of survivors, we are united in our responsibility to listen to survivors and preserve the memory of the Holocaust. We must collectively remember the individual stories. In 2010, I helped create a concrete way for the third generation to take ownership and responsibility of our legacy. 3GNY launched an educational initiative called We Do, which stands for We Educate. We Do trains grandchildren of survivors to learn and share their family histories in schools. To date, we have prepared 300 grandchildren who have spoken to over 30,000 students in schools throughout the New York, New Jersey, and Washington DC area. We are proud of what we have accomplished, but when you consider that there are more than 1 million students in New York City alone, we know our work has only just begun. In gathering together tonight, we demonstrate our hope and belief in the goodness of humanity despite the tremendous proof we have to the contrary. It is now my great privilege to introduce Hetty Bohm. Hetty Bohm was born in 1928 in Oradia, Transylvania, and was the only child to Ignaz, a master cabinet maker, and Erzibet, a homemaker. Hetty attended an all girls Jewish school until grade 10. In April of 1944, Hetty and her family were sent to the Oradia ghetto and from there, she was deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Hetty was then selected for forced work detail at an ammunition factory and shipped to Germany in August 44. Hetty was liberated by American forces in April, 1945. Hetty, thank you again for being here tonight. I know you changed the format on me last minute and you would rather I ask you questions than you just tell your story. Um, and I'm very happy to ask you questions. Um, we're gonna try and ask you things that you're not typically asked, um, but feel free at any point to take us wherever you want. Um, so to start, I just wanna ask you, when did you start talking publicly about your experience in the Holocaust? Quite, quite late in life. I uh, wasn't ready until the early 2000s, and even then, very reluctantly got into it. I've never been a public speaker, and basically I'm a very shy person. Even in our friends, when we gathered in a large group, I was the one who listened rather than talked. So this was something totally new that I had to learn to be able to speak about things that are hurtful, that were hurtful, that are difficult for young people to listen to and for me to remember. But when I looked around in the early 2000s and knowing that I'm a survivor, I'm here, and to have to hear that this never happened, Holocaust denial, hit me very, very deeply. And I was thinking, if, can, if it happens now, if people will believe those who spout these lies, what's going to happen when there are no more survivors around to testify, to object, to tell their stories? And that's when I decided I must tell my story and got in touch with the Neuberger Center and started over there to talk to students that were coming to the museum 
at the time there. Eventually, uh, the Wiesenthal Center and some private schools also saw some uh, YouTube articles that appeared about me and reached out to me. And I never said no to anyone who wanted to listen. And I just want to tell you that I just found this. I totally forgot about it. This is where I was four years ago on Yom HaShoah, Nova Scotia. No. Uh, they don't have any survivors there, only a very small Jewish community. And they reached out and asked me to come. And so that's where I was four years ago. Well, it's so good that you were there and that you're here with us tonight. Um, but I, I just want to explore this a little more, if we can. I, in preparing tonight, I was listening to some of your testimony on uh, the March of the Living website. And I wrote down something you said, which was, um, I have to get over my fear of my memories. And um, in the early 2000s, when you started to, when you decided to speak, um, how did you know where to start in telling your story? Had you told your children? Had you told your husband? Um, how did you, how did you overcome your fears? <sighs> You do what you must do, what your heart tells you, you have to do, no matter how difficult it is. I'm sure what you're doing is not easy for you either. And you do it and you're getting better and better at it to my greatest delight. And for me, it was just having to talk to myself. Hedy, you have to do it, that's it. No excuse. I, I couldn't find an excuse not to do it. How so, old were you when you were um, taken to the ghetto? 15. And you were an only child? I was an only child in grade 10. And in the ghetto, even though we were there only one month in May, if you remember, I was uh, in April, I was born in May 11th. So I had my 16th birthday in the ghetto. I don't think we even had a piece of cake to celebrate it. So I feel life owes me a 16th birthday party. It does. <laughs> Did you make your, your children a big 16th birthday? You know, I don't remember. Okay. You have to ask them. Okay, I will ask them. Um, well, they had a big 13th, which also I didn't have at the time. Right, I bet. When you were in the ghetto, um, were you, did you know what was coming? Had you heard of Auschwitz? I didn't, although I'm sure our parents did. But in those days, even at 15 and 16 in grade tens, we were as naive as today's first grader or more so. Don't forget, we had absolutely no knowledge of the world no internet, no television, no iPhone, no iPad, no nowhere to get information other than the government propaganda on the radio. It was forbidden to listen to uh, stations outside of the country. And uh, the Jewish people weren't even allowed to have a radio after 43. They took everything slowly away from us as far as possessions were go, uh, considered. The men were taken away 18 to 48 from 40, 1942. Women were left there without a breadwinner to uh, manage life with children and rent and school and closing. I don't know how they did it. And the way we were brought up, it was to listen, don't argue, don't ask questions, don't rock the boat, just listen and be quiet and everything will be all right. 
absolutely no knowledge amongst myself, my classmates, my cousins about what was happening. They didn't hear it discussed either. In school, not a mention was about what the world was like. Even in the last month, in grade 10, just, just before uh, the school closed down, we were told that's the latest law in March, just when we started wearing the star to no more education for Jewish children. The principal said goodbye to us and finished his announcement with saying he hopes we will be able to continue after the war. We had no idea what was coming, what was waiting for us. And then you were all taken to the ghetto? The ghetto? And we were only there about a month. You who tell me you know the geography of my birthplace and the surrounding area, can you imagine had we been left in a ghetto only three more months, everyone would have been surviving, saved. The Russians broke through the border in September. We were taken away in June. Three months and the 30,000 people in a ghetto, 100,000 population of the city, 30,000 Jews, mostly female, the men were taken away, as I said, to forced labor groups. They were all would have been saved. But the Hungarian Nazis were as eager or more eager than the German Nazis to put their hands on our homes, our furniture, our belongings, our businesses. And they were so pleased to shove us into the cattle cars and get rid of us. I have, not, I have not even seen a Nazi German soldier. I've only seen Hungarian Nazi soldiers in my city. They did it all. You sound like my grandmother. It's, it, your words echo so deeply. She was, I said earlier to Hetty, for those of you that have joined us tonight, that my parents were born after the war, but in Transylvania. And Hetty told me that her maiden name is Klein, and that's my father's family's name. But hearing the way you describe it brings me to a story I heard from a survivor about 15 years ago when the American Society of Yad Vashem first started their teacher training program. And um, I was helping, you know, staff the table, handing out flyers. I don't even think I was a teacher then. And uh, a survivor came to the teacher workshop and no one was gonna tell him not to join, right? And at the end, I saw him sitting very quietly by the, by the coat racks and I just went up to him to see if he was okay. Um, he was Polish and um, he had survived horrible, horrible, circumstances, but he said to me, when I told him my family is Hungarian Romanian, he said, he broke down crying and he said, it's the greatest tragedy, Leora, that in 1944, so close to liberation, 400,000 Jews from your family's area was killed like that. And that's exactly, I think what you're saying today, it's, yes. it's devastating. So yes. when, when you got to Auschwitz, were you still with your parents? For about a minute and a half. Soon as we were ordered off, the men immediately had to go to the left. I didn't even have a chance to say goodbye to my father. And he was on the left with the rest of the men. And I never saw him again. And as I was trying to make sense of the barracks, the camps, the fences that I was looking at on the ramp after I jumped off the cattle car, I couldn't imagine where is this place or what is this place for or what 
is the purpose. I, I, it was just beyond anything I, my mind could grasp. What could it be for? It never occurred to me. Never. I mean, who could imagine that? No one. And I'm sure my parents heard stories what's happening to the Polish Jews. I'm sure other friends, parents also did. But we kept on saying it could never happen here. You know, you heard that before. It could never happen to us. My father, who was uh, in the First World War as a Hungarian soldier with the Hungarian army, said the Hungarian government would never betray its Hungarian Jewish citizens. Right. He believed that, and he died for it. So in an, about another minute, the order was given for the women to stand in rows of five and march under the famous sign, Arbeit macht frei, work liberates you. And I realized that while I was trying to understand where am I and what is this place, my mother started walking. And she walked ahead of me. I started running after her. But I don't want to go into that. Let it be just that I never caught up with her. And she went on a road where all the other women with babies in their arms and grandmothers went straight to the gas chambers. And I was selected to go with young women into a holding tank type of place called Sea Lager, Camp C, which is around my age or somewhat older women who were not sent to the gas chamber because they wanted us to be slave labor at some point, which we did become. And uh, I think the greatest trauma in my life was that moment when I saw my mother go away from me. That was one of the reasons I couldn't talk about this for a very, very long time. And, and then um, I heard you speak about the barbed wires, um, the fences. Was there ever a thought to try and escape? There was no chance, not in a million years. As, as you've seen photos and as I saw when I got off the cattle car, one camp to the next, to the next, to the next, as far as I could see to the left, to the right, that's all there was, camp after camp after camp, huge camps. Each one of them had 30 barracks, huge, huge barracks. Each camp was able to accommodate in those 30 barracks anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people. Can you imagine that? No. That camp C was built for the Hungarian Jews quickly. They didn't even have time to put bunk frames into all the, all the barracks. Some just had the ground, same as you walked on the ground outside, it was the same inside. That's the kind of barrack I was in, lying on the ground, hundreds of us, like next to each other. So we all had about, we all had about as much space as, let's say, a yoga mat. Mm. Did you have any friends? You were totally alone. I was totally alone, even though I tried to join once with not a friend, but a new friend that somehow we liked each other, similar young woman. And for about a week, we stayed together and then drifted apart. And once I tried to join an auntie and I stayed about a week with her and her daughter, but I realized I felt more alone when I was with someone else than when I was alone. And I must tell you, I went through the whole time in Auschwitz-Birkenau 
not knowing about the gas chambers and about the crematorium. Is that a believable thought? Anything you tell me, I believe. I can't believe that I was there three months. No one ever told me. I never thought of asking. How is that possible? I, I, I was thinking about it. How is that possible? Was it luck? I came to the conclusion I must have had a guardian angel who made me blind and deaf to all the evil that was going on in order to survive, in order to be able to hope. And I hoped that I will be together with my mother as soon as this is over. I just have to survive every day and then another day. Stay healthy, stay clean. Went to the barrack where the wash basins were every morning in the dark before roll calls. Took my little dress off and my wooden sole boots. That's all we were given there, no underwear. And I washed myself down from head to toe every morning in the cold faucet, in the water from the cold faucets. That's all there was. And I wanted to stay healthy. I wanted to stay heat clean. I understood that was a main factor in survival. And to eat all the slop they gave you because there might be some nourishment in it, no matter how awful it was. And it was awful. Three months I spent there, didn't know. And then I went to Germany and spent another seven or eight months as, as labor, slave labor. And I didn't know that either. I found out on my day of liberation that I am an orphan. So it was the happiest day for a few minutes and then the saddest for me. April 14th, 1945. But let me add to this a happier note. Do you know what that is? Um, Am Yisrael Chai, what is that? Yom HaShoah celebration 2010 in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I'm there Wow. And I lit a torch. And this man is the chief rabbi of Israel, who was also in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Rabbi Lau? Yeah. Give and, me one. Yeah. And behind me was the camp, sea camp, where I was a slave. And the radio was blaring the Hatikva in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I was singing, all of us, everyone, and in front of me, 10,000 young Jewish boys and girls singing. I cried like a baby from sheer happiness that I lived that day. And I want to take you to another day that is incredible to me. In 2016 and 2017, you were flown back to Germany to stand as a witness at the trial of Oskar Gronig. And for whomever doesn't know, he was considered the accountant of Auschwitz. Um, how was that for you the first time you saw him in that courtroom? It was a surprise after the picture in my mind of the young arrogance of the SS guards on the ramp that greeted us in 44 with the shiny boots, speak and span, everything on them, while this bedraggled lot of us after three days and three nights in filth and dirt and stench and hungry, mixed up, totally 
dizzy from whatever happened during those three days and three nights locked in there, getting off there and seeing these supermen. And here at the German court came in, pushing a walker, this frail old man. One and the same. What time does? And for days, he enjoyed himself telling the story about what he was doing in Auschwitz and how it was in Auschwitz-Birkenau. He kept on saying how he had the best time of his life, how much food there was, how much vodka there was, how much companionship amongst the Nazi officers, the women and the men. He made lifelong friendships the best time of his life. <sighs> you have the courage to today to tell us about it. And that's amazing. I am privileged to have been there. And I first I had my doubts if I can do it because just the idea of being surrounded by the German language, being in Germany, it just gave me the shudders. I was accustomed to associate German language with the worst that were going on in Germany and in Auschwitz-Birkenau. But again, I'm so glad I did it. And I was able to speak for those who couldn't speak anymore. And uh, it also brought an unexpected gift because I met so many nice German people that knowing them while I visited there, getting to know them and talking to them, I lost completely that darkness. I got rid of that fear and dread in my heart of the German language and Germans and Germany. Wow. And I can't tell you the relief of not having as a matter of fact, I even started using my high school German to speak to other people, which was a big step for me. And, and it's a relief. It was a gift. Wow. And how do you feel about the, the grandchildren taking on the stories and keeping these stories alive? Um, if I would have one wish, that would be it for the grandchildren to take up the stories and to go on as you are. Well, and I... may you be successful in everything you try to do, all the good things. Thank you. I could spend two more days talking to you, but I want to include our grandchildren of survivors into this oh, conversation. I can hardly wait to hear them. Oh, Seretlek, you speak Hungarian, right? <laughs> yeah, my mother tongue. Thank you, me yeah. too. Okay, so it's my pleasure now to introduce um, Dana Rogozinski of the American Society for Yad Vashem Young Leadership, Jonathan Jacobs of 3GNY, and Raquel Binder of Liberation 75. Um, thank you to each of you for joining us tonight in this commemoration. And I really would love to start um, hearing from each of you. Maybe Raquel, you could be the first to begin. I'd love to know a little bit about your grandparents' story and um, when you first learned about the Holocaust. And from Raquel, I'll go to Jonathan and then Dana. Uh Thank you so much. It's also always so wonderful to hear from Hetty. I, it's been a couple of years since I've last heard her. So it's such a, a privilege to be able to hear her and learn something new every time. Um, my grandparents on my father's side were survivors. Um, I never knew much of either my Bubby or uh, my grandfather's story. My grandfather 
passed away before I was born. My Bubby is still alive. Um, I, from my understanding, my grandfather is from Lodz. Uh, I believe that he fled and fought, fought in the Russian army, but I do not know much. Um, my Bubby Mary was born in Poland. Uh, she is an Auschwitz survivor along with her mother, Esther. Um, never knew her story growing up, always knew she was a survivor. Uh, and uh, our family were, uh, we are a family of survivors. On my mom's side, uh, my Bubby Joy and my lady Fred were not survivors, however, very dedicated to passing along Jewish culture and heritage. And I actually, from my memory, learned more about what the Holocaust was and how it connected to our family through their stories and through learning and connecting with my Zadie. Um, always would ask my Bubby about her story, was very curious. My first memory of learning about the Holocaust was at Hebrew school in I believe first or second grade where I was shown quite inappropriately, uh, very horrendous images of the Holocaust and went home crying to my parents uh, until I finally was able to be gently introduced to it. Um, fourth grade, we were reading Number of the Stars and I went to my bubby, Mary the Survivor, asking for a Megan David necklace, just like the character in Number of the Stars and was met with some hostility and to never speak of it again. And then sure enough, just a few weeks later was presented with the necklace from her, which I still have. And that seemed to be our relationship ongoing. Uh, I would get little glimpses. Um, I was an intern at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York and did ask for some information so I could start researching um, and got a few names from my father. Uh, Again, names were known, survivor was known, but we didn't know the details and I didn't have enough information to really find anything. And it wasn't until um, I went on the March of the Living, my brother had gone to Poland a few years ago before that through Billowim, uh, Israel, a camp here in the Toronto area. And he tried to get some information, got the bare minimum, Weirdly enough, that notebook went missing. Um, and then when I was going on the March of the Living, I tried to ask my Bubby for names. Again, was met with hostility. And eventually I said, I just want to say Kaddish. Please tell me a few names. She gave me her sister's names, which was always met with tears. I sent them to my trip leader who ended up finding not only what happened to my Bubby sisters, but found their burial site, which is in Celts. They were murdered in a uh, mass burial of children in the ghetto. Um, and I actually was able to go and visit and say Kaddish at the memorial and then return to Toronto and tell my Bubby the story of her sisters. My dad was with me, my brothers came to talk through that as well. And we opened up the floodgates and were able to learn so much more about her history and her story. Um, I even gave her my old computer and she started typing out her story. So we do have documentation now. She is in her 90s and unfortunately uh, suffering from Alzheimer's. So we, I feel very grateful that I was able to get that story and, and share it with my family. Wow. Just one question. What year was your trip to March of the Living? 2013. So this is so pretty, I, recent, like pretty recent. Finding. Yeah. Wow, incredible. Thank you, uh, Raquel. Um, Jonathan, I'm just gonna ask you the same. How did you first learn about the Holocaust and a little bit about your grandparents' story? Yeah, well, well, thank you. And I'm really happy to be here and be part of this group. It's just so many amazing people talking. So very happy. Um, so uh, both of my grandparents on my mother's side uh, were Holocaust survivors and they actually um, met one another in a displaced persons camp in Austria, actually where my mother was born before they came to the United States. Um, so both of my grandparents were born in, in Poland, uh, in, in different areas, but in Poland. Um, my grandmother had a journey where she was um, basically going from work camp to work camp in, in all women's camps um, where they were making actually parachutes for uh, German forces. Um, and uh, basically her, her the end of her journey was um, a sort of a quasi famous uh, death march that was uh, ended in the city of Volary, um, which was started with about 1300 all women 
Um, they were walking in the winter. It was, I think, January of 1945 till May 1945 in cold winter with no winter gear, uh, with no nothing but wooden shoes um, or clogs. And um, I think about 300 of those women out of 1,300 actually even ended up surviving, mostly because they didn't have food, because it was too cold. Um, and at the end of that march, my grandmother, uh, who was not a courageous person who never wanted to escape or never thought she had the courage to, um, felt compelled to with another woman, um, and they did. Um, and the rest of the group was liberated about a couple months or maybe a month later. So it was at the tail end. Um, and my, my grandfather had a... Uh, a very interesting story as well. Um, mind you, both of their entire families, their parents, their siblings, if they had any, their uncles, aunts, all were murdered in Auschwitz um, on both sides. So they are the they were the only living uh, survivors. But um, my grandfather uh, had his whole family that was sent to Auschwitz. He had to say goodbye to his family as well, and in, in different lines, going left, going right, um, and he actually. Um, had a interesting journey where uh, on the day before he was supposed to be sent to what was uh, everybody was who was selected on that that evening would be killed the next day. Um, they had asked if anyone had um, you know certain experience in in certain uh, tasks, one of which was printing. Now my my grandfather was not a printer, um, but his father was, and so he he wrote that yes he was a printer. Um, and that next day he was not killed with that group of people that should have been, um, but he was taken with 143 other men um, to Sachsenhausen concentration camp, um, which was 350 miles away at that point. Um, and he was part of, of what some people may know, which was called Operation Bernhard, which was a, a pretty fascinating story. It was made into a couple of books and, and a movie as well called The Counterfeiters, um, which was this group of 144 men. Um, and they were put into a concentration camp within a concentration camp they were, they were treated slightly better, uh, not bad, not good, um, but slightly better. And what they were doing was they were trying to forge um, documents, namely the British pound for the Germans um, so that they could take uh, millions and millions of British pounds, um, put it into the British economy and ruin their economy in that way. And um, what ended up happening, thank God, they did uh, they succeeded in making great British pounds, but it was never implemented into the economy. Um, and they ended up in three years making uh, what was about 132 million uh, pounds, which is today $6 billion. Um, and they did a fascinating job, but um, thankfully they kept moving the factories as uh, allied forces were approaching. Um, they were never able to really do it. Um, and then finally he was, he was liberated from uh, Ebensee uh, camp. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. It, again, it sounds like it, it's straight out of a movie and, and namely that's why they did that. Um, but, but yeah, uh, just getting quickly to how I sort of come into this. I'm, I'm incredibly passionate about this. I wear this like it is, it is you know, written on me, um, but I, I have no recollection of this great, uh, my parents telling me about it or my grandparents telling me about it, because I don't know if there, there was a moment like that. This was something that was, it was part of my identity as far as I can ever remember. I was a grandchild of Holocaust survivors and my grandparents' best friends were all Holocaust survivors and my parents, people that we called cousins were Holocaust survivors. So it was not, uh, I don't think I, I don't, I don't recall, maybe my, my mom would tell me different, but I don't think I had a sit down conversation to tell me what was happening. I, I knew that this was part of my identity, just like I knew I was Jewish. Um, and so when I went to Hebrew school and was learning about this, I knew that this was what my grandparents were. I may not have known details. I may not have known visual images that I learned so much later, but again, it was, it was a part of my identity as far as I can recall. Wow. I mean, I could dedicate three nights to each of you by yourselves. I don't even know how you um, hold on to all of the details of those two different stories. I mean, I, I do know how you hold on to them, but it's, it's a lot. And I commend you guys for um, having the passion and the commitment to knowing. I mean, Raquel, you had to fight for it until 2013. Jonathan, you were born with it, as you said, written on you. Um, and you both are here tonight, so thank you so much. And Dana, last but not least, um, if you would tell us a little bit about how you come to know your family story and what it is. 
Sure. So um, like Jonathan said as well, I don't think there's a specific time that I felt like, okay, now I understand my family history. It was something that was always just there. It was always something that was referenced or talked about. Um, I know my grandparents, I'm a grandchild of two survivors on my father's side, one from Czechoslovakia, one from Poland. Um, we always knew that they were survivors. We knew that we were different than some of the other people in our community who were Jewish, but not part of the survivor community. Um, but there was never really anything that stood out saying, okay, now, now I understand. Um, my grandmother was one of four and um, her and her two sisters survived Auschwitz and were liberated in April in Bergen-Belsen. Um, her brother was the only one separated um, with the men and with the boys and he did not survive. Um, my grandfather from Poland was one of seven and him and his brother were the only ones that survived on their side. He was the youngest, all of them were married with children. So um, he lost everyone. Um, we don't know too much about his story as he never talked about it as much. It was too hard for him. My grandmother, um, it wasn't until the early 90s when someone in our um, community, in our synagogue, asked if there was a survivor that was willing to talk and tell their story that she actually felt like now's the time. Um, she never really talked about it with her three sons. It wasn't until she really had grandchildren that she um, felt the need to tell the story, to teach um, what hate can do and to teach that you need to spread love. So my grandmother, like I said, she was um, liberated from Bergen-Belsen. She spent a lot of her time in Auschwitz. Um, they were in a ghetto and then transported to Auschwitz um, via cable car. Um, she was there with her father, her mother, her grandmother, her aunts, her uncles, and her siblings. And when they were telling them, you know, whether they needed to go right or go left, her dad and her brother went one way, all of the women went the other way. And her mom um, was with her and her sisters and felt that she needed to take care of her mother, which is my grandmother's grandmother, and um, switched places with her sister. She said, you take care of my girls. I'm going to take care of mom. Had she not done that, she might have survived with her th three daughters she was taking her mother without knowing to the crematorium, to the gas chambers, and her sister stayed with, their, um, with her three nieces and they were survivors together. Their numbers, they all were tattooed on their arms. Their numbers were consecutive, one after the other. Um, but once they were in the camp, they couldn't let anybody know that they were related or that they were sisters because they didn't want people to have a group that would allow them to continue, allow them to stay positive. Um, so they would check on each other. They would constantly bring the scraps of food, um, dog food back and forth to ensure that they weren't starving, that they could make it through another day, but they couldn't stay together because they couldn't, they didn't want anyone finding out that they were related or that they were looking out for one another to survive. Um, they did go through the death march from Auschwitz to Bergen-Belsen in the winter. Um, one of her sisters lost her shoes, um, got frostbite, almost didn't make it. Luckily, a doctor was one of the prisoners and was able to um, help them rectify that situation um, until they got to Bergen-Belsen and they were um, liberated by, uh, I think, by the Americans. Wow. How old around were the sisters? Um, my grandmother was 12 or 13 at the time when, when they were moved to the ghetto. Um, and then they were, they were moved around a little bit and then they spent a majority of their time in Auschwitz. And did the aunt survive? The aunt did survive um, by watching out for her three nieces and then watching out for her. Um, and they all, um, my uncles who are born post post war, they called that her softa, softa Leia, because that was the closest thing that they ever had to a grandmother. Um, they didn't know what grandparents were. They didn't know how to have a relationship with a grandparent because it was their parents and that was it. Right. Right. Wow. Thank you. Um, so each of you mentioned how you have either learned or absorbed the story. Um, 
when your grandparents did finally come to the United States, um, and Jonathan, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Um, did they surround themselves um, with only survivor communities? Did they branch out? Um, I, you mentioned briefly that you speak about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, I, I will say that. The, an the short answer is yes. Um, my grandparents did have other friends, um, actually, to my mom's dismay, my, my grandma actually used to label them as her friends and then she had her American friends. So she certain viewed, certainly viewed them in sort of different ways, but she viewed one as really being family while one as being friends. I think that was really the distinction, but um, it's a pretty fascinating story, which is my grandparents and uh, four other couples that they had met in this displaced persons camp in Austria actually had reconvened when they went back to New York and, and they really created a family um, here in New York. And, and each of them had, I think pretty much at least two, all of them had two kids um, and all of those kids had different kids. And we used to get together uh, quite often. My, my mom certainly and her brother, uh, they used to get together with these cousins and these aunts and uncles um, incredibly often, but we did as, as uh, kids as well. And, and I'm proud to say that of that group of three Gs, um, myself and two others have completed the We Do training. Um, and so, you know, that family, that whole thing that, that my grandparents created, whether purposeful or not, um, made us feel as though it was our obligation to go out um, to keep their legacy alive. Not only my grandparents, but those other great aunts and great uncles as well. Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Long Island. Long Island. And Dean, I'm gonna reverse the order so you don't go last again. Um, where did you grow up, Dana? I grew up from in Jacksonville, Florida. That's what I thought. Okay. There's there's actually a, a decent uh, Holocaust where there was a decent Holocaust community there. Okay. Because when you said that your grandfather stood up for the first time, it was not. It was unusual for the community to have a survivor. Not for the community to have a survivor, but to have a survivor that wanted to share their story. Okay. So the same question for you. Firstly, how did you guys get to Jacksonville? But <laughs> if that's going to take you off track, um, were your grandparents um, surrounding themselves always with survivors? Um, and how did that affect you as their grandchild? Um, okay, so the first question, how did we end up in Jacksonville? Yeah. After the war, um, again, like Jonathan, my grandparents met in a displaced persons camp. Um, and were married. And my grandfather found out that he had a surviving brother who escaped to Russia and then moved to Israel. So my grandmother and my grandfather, um, after the war, after they got married, they, they moved to Israel and they lived there. While my grandmother's sisters who survived went on a boat to the United States, they went through the, the port of New Orleans. And Jacksonville was one of the cities accepting um, survivors. So they ended up there. 10 years later, my grandmother um, was ready to, to leave Israel. And um, you know they had just become a state and it was another war after they had just survived and she didn't wanna lose any more family. Um, so they moved to Jacksonville where her sisters were. And I actually just um, spoke with, with my dad earlier today asking the same question. Um, because I felt it was one thing, I just wanted confirmation. My grandparents had a huge community of survivors that they all spoke, their common language was all Yiddish. Some were from Austria, some were from Germany, some were from Poland, some were from Czechoslovakia. Um, and they all found each other either through the Jewish community or through you know trying to, to find jobs, trying to um, assimilate and the, they became, they all became best friends. That was their circle. Um, their kids all grew up together and were definitely more cousins than friends. Um, now take it to the third generation. We are still friends with their children. And now the fourth generation is, is coming to that as well. So um, they definitely formed their own community within survivor, within the survivor community. And, and it's still four generations later, it's still there. Amazing. And Raquel, you mentioned that your grandmother, um, you met such hostility when you asked her questions. So I'm so curious, did she associate with other survivors or did she try and um, differentiate herself? 
I would say from my understanding, a little bit of both. Um, they moved actually right after the war, she moved to Berlin. Um, it wasn't safe to go back to Poland and Berlin did have quite a large population of survivors. So safety in numbers. And uh, she met my grandfather, Jack in Poland before they moved to Berlin and they started smuggling cigarettes and jewels and made quite a fortune enough to move to New Jersey where my father was born. Um, they, and then moved to Toronto. I believe they opened a box factory and kind of worked their way up into real estate business, which my uh, family is still in today. Uh, Toronto had a large and still has a large survivor population uh, and Jewish community tended to live in the same area. So I don't know if she identified with survivors as those are the people that she wanted to be around, but like my dad went to a Jewish day school as did his brother, uh, the family were very much so connected to the Jewish community. Uh, and I actually did find out when I went on the March of the Living for, I wanna say it was the third or fourth time at this point that um, one of the survivors, Howard Kleinberg, may he rest in peace, his wife, Nancy was actually in the same camp as my Bubby. They were, they shared a bunker. This was prior to Auschwitz. and. Um, from Nancy, I learned that she always was connected to my Bubby, but they never talked about it and they, they kind of knew, but it was, it was not something that they spoke about together. So I think it was always a part of, but not how she lived her life identifying. I understand. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to pay attention to the time, um, but I also want to continue the conversation and um, I want to know about you, um, Raquel, as third generation, um, are there, is there something that you do, I know you've made an enormous commitment to fact find and build this family story, but is there something that you do in your daily life or in your work life um, that you feel honors uh, your grandparents' survival? Uh yeah, I, this is something that I've tried to develop a lot of understanding of in the past few years as I've made career pivots. Um, I did work in the Jewish community for a better part of eight years uh, in various programs, including March of the Living. Uh, and I also uh, worked for a company called Diller where I traveled. I, I think I've been to Israel well over 14 times on various education trips. I've been to Poland six times on various education trips. Um, and in the past few years, I've actually pivoted and left working in the Jewish community uh, to work actually in the tech world. Um, and I work, I'm one of four Jewish people in my company, I believe at the moment. Uh, as far as I know, it's not something that's brought up very often. And I actually can say that I feel more connected to being a 3G now than I ever did in my years working for the Jewish community. And I feel like I'm, it's both my responsibility and my privilege to be able to teach inclusion, uh, equality, empathy, whether it be about being Jewish, about being the grandchildren, a grandchild of a survivor, or just being about treating people like people and understanding who they are, the struggles they come from, and how to just make sure that people feel that sense of belonging and that no one ever feels left out because of who they are. Interesting that you feel more identified or, or now something to explore. But I, I do want to just ask Dana, um, is there something that you do in your daily life or your professional life that is consciously or subconsciously um, to honor your grandparents? Um, well, the first thing is I actually moved to New York for work but what really drew me to um, the city was the 3G community. Um, I had discovered um, the American Society for Yad Vashem through social media. And um, through that came up for one of their events and just fell in love with the entire community, with the 3Gs that I had met um, and became very involved in several Holocaust organizations. So first and foremost, I changed my entire life um, to come and be a part of the community because it really felt 
um, uh, like Raquel said, like a privilege and an honor um, to be in this group. Um, in addition, several years ago, as my grandmother unfortunately um, started suffering with Alzheimer's and dementia, um, her tattoo on her arm started to fade. And that's when um, I had a piece of jewelry designed, or I designed a piece of jewelry from, um, from a family jeweler um, with her number on it. Um, in addition to my grandfather's prisoner number. So I wear their numbers with me every day um, so that not only do I feel that they're part of me and they're almost guiding me um, and they're with me, but also, so when someone sees it, it's not, it's not a comfortable conversation, but when someone sees it and they say, what are, what do those random numbers mean? Or what is that? It sparks the conversation a little bit more easily and a little bit, um, more random and you're able to have those kinds of uncomfortable conversations and make it more um, at the forefront and make it more of something that you need to be comfortable hearing about and you need to be comfortable talking about. Can, can we see it? Can you show us? <laughs> uh, can y'all see? So this is my grandmother's number. It's wow. A5674. Wow. And then this one over here this is my grandfather's. I don't know if y'all can see. The numbers are spread out. It's wow. five, six, five, one, two. Wow. And do you, could I get that if I wanted? Like, could you help me with that? Absolutely. Anyone who wants one, um, I can customize it for um, for your specific family did member. You know? Did your grandmother know you did this? So she was on, she's understanding a little bit when I started it. Um, but now when I, when I see her and when I visit her and I talk to her, um, she, this, she doesn't want to hold my hand. She only plays with it. Wow. So, um, I, I think I take that as she, she likes it. Um, in addition, I, I have worked with several survivors to create their own pieces for them and for their families. Um, so by doing that, it allows me to feel like I actually am doing something that's helpful and that's remembering not the number to dehumanize them, but um, as a way to spark the conversation and bring it to the forefront that I wouldn't be able to do without, without having a number tattooed on my arm. Yes, thank you. Um, Jonathan, you mentioned your um, commitment that you went through the We Do training program and so did some of the non-first cousins, first cousins, but as there other areas in your daily life that you actively remember? And at the same time, I'd like to add another question. Um, are there lessons that um, you think can be shared from this horror? I really always say I don't like that question because it could be misinterpreted, but I trust that you understand what I mean. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think as of, as of, just recent years, I've, I've probably had be a little, there's a little, you know, reinvigorated with my passion towards all of this um, and telling my grandparents story. And, and I think, you know, a part of that is I grew up, uh, you know, as I mentioned in Long Island in a very Jewish community, um, you know, I, I took for granted my, my Judaism and, and um, you know, just being comfortable where I am. Um, and, you know, I, my wife actually is from Iowa, an area that is not Jewish. Um, and I've had the privilege of of telling her and her family my grandparents' stories and to see them resonate with them and, and the impact that they get for people that may have never met someone that is a 3G, a 2G, or a survivor um, has really made me think, well, I, I have to continue to educate people about what happened here and how close at times we may be from things happening like this. And, and things do happen like this around the world. And, and you know, we aren't always talking about them. And so I think for me, um, that's what's really driven it, which is um, I want people to know what this is and, and what this is about. And, and, you know, especially in areas where they do not have a Jewish community and they've never had a personal connection to the Holocaust. It is just a topic they may learn for a couple of hours, um, you know, it, it, once every four okay. years, you know, right. or never. Um, and so my impact and what I've dedicated myself to and what 3GNY and the We Do program really is, 
has been going into schools and educating. And I'm in process of working with schools now, not just in New York, but in Iowa to implement that there. Um, I'll see that, because, get on that. Yeah, and, then, and, and I think that there's a lot of education to do. And I hope that again, I hope that there's a bigger picture from it, which is not just telling the story of this tragic event, but it is to make those children or adults, whoever's you know, learning the story or hearing my grandparents' stories and seeing people suffering at the hands of other humans, um, and not all of whom were, were just Nazis that you can label as Nazis. Um, I hope that it makes them maybe think twice about actions that they take on a daily basis or um, times where they see other people doing wrong um, and make them think, to, you know, what would I do in that scenario? Would I step in? Would I, whether it's small, big picture, small, that's my goal in, in all of this. I'm proud of you. I know I just met you, but that's really awesome. Keep going, keep doing it. And Raquel, um, I think this is gonna be our last question, unfortunately, because of time. Um, are there lessons that you carry with you um, in sharing this with future descendants? Is there a, somewhere a hidden message that guides you? You can answer this any way you want. <laughs> Yeah, a couple of things coming to mind. I think firstly, one of the things that people ask me a lot and after I finished leading uh, at March the Living Trip or any education program is not everyone is comfortable being vocal and being outspoken, outspoken about their family's history or standing up for being a Jew. So asking how one can still carry on the message and make the world a better place as cheesy as that sounds. And I, I truly believe that the lessons to take away are to be the best possible person that you can be and to, to lead with empathy, to lead with understanding. And I have two brothers, um, both are wonderful and I would say are wonderful Jews that my grandparents are so proud of and neither are as outspoken as I, but each lead their day-to-day -day lives doing good and carrying forward the lessons of our family. And I think for every young Jew or any person to just go forth in their day-to-day -day lives, being good people and, and treating others with kindness is number, I think number one. And that is regardless of what religion you are as well. But I think as a 3G, we have a little bit more of a responsibility because we do know more. The other thing that I carry forward a lot is this idea that, yeah, I'm a name, uh, not necessarily a number, because in so many aspects of our world, people are categorized by just being one of many people. And I, I always look to what is your name? Who are you? Tell me about yourself. And that's something that I carry forward a lot with me. Thank you. Thank you. And Dana, did you wanna add anything to the conversation? And we are, the program is not entirely over. We have a very special musical piece coming up, but um, anything about the lessons or how to carry this legacy more? Um, for lessons, I, I'm also agreeing with Raquel that I think it's really, we have a responsibility to, um, to be the voice and to, to really teach about love and teach about caring for others and um, what hate can do as we've all seen or we've learned through our grandparents. Um, I also think that especially now um, we all, we need to teach the future generations to speak up more and to not just be silent because it's cool to be silent or to not say something because you're scared of what someone else is going to think. Because if we're all silent, then we're going to let this happen again. Um, so I just think that we all need to, to be vocal and um, we need to stand up for ourselves and for our Jewish community and, and ensure that anti-Semitism is not on the rise and, and it stopped with the Holocaust and, and we don't allow something like that to ever happen again. Right, but that has to happen bit by bit, person by person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you, Dana. Um, the work that you're doing um, is inspiring. It is just the tip of the iceberg and we must empower your friends, your communities, your less vocal brothers. 
um, to stand up with us. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Alexis Fishman, who is a former board member, uh, a singer, an actor, and just an all around intrepid young woman. So Alexis, thank you. Thank you so much, Leora. Um, what a beautiful panel and presentation. Um, very happy to be here. We're going to just close with a short song that I'm sure is um, familiar to many of you. It's somewhat of a um, of an unofficial uh, anthem of Yom HaShoah, particularly in Israel, um, with lyrics written by Hannah Senesh, who at the age of 23 parachuted uh, into Nazi-occupied Europe to try and save Hungarian Jews. She was captured, uh, interrogated, tortured, didn't give up any information about her mission and was sadly executed by firing squad at the age of uh, 23 in 1944. So this was a poem that she wrote in um, 1942 and it was set to music by David Zahavi in 1945. Um, I suspect it's familiar to many of you. It's called A Walk to Caesarea. Eli, Eli, Shelo Igamer Leolam, Hahol Vehayam, Rishru Shel Hamayim, Berak Hashamayim, Tvila. that song many many times Alexis but never quite like that that was really beautiful I want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight um, Alexis Hetty Dana Jonathan and Raquel and to your organizations for coming together for this important conversation um, if anybody that you know from Iowa to Toronto needs a 3G speaker to share a family story in a classroom, a synagogue, a church, a mosque, a living room, a community group, call us, reach out to us. We are eager to educate and, and, and we have the resources to support your needs. We are eager to help you share your family history. As you've heard here tonight, it's primarily through us that the future generations will, will hear the actual stories of our grandparents' survival. Alexis, you really did me in. Um, thank you all for joining. And Hedy, really, it was a great honor to hear from you tonight. Thank you.